Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss elements of the feeding systems. When we look at the feeding system, basically there are different kinds of rations on the dairy farm. The first ration we talk about is the one that is on paper, put together by the dairy nutritionist where we calculate what the cow really requires and how much feed it will take to get the job done. The second ration is the one that is mixed on the farm. Here the risk comes in at how accurate we are in mixing the feed, getting the right amounts in, and getting the proper mixing action on the farm. The third ration is that ration consumed by the cow. The cow can now sort and select various parts of the components of the various feed ingredients, depending on particle size, palatability, and other factors. So she may not actually consume what we have in the bunk. Finally, the fourth ration, which is a relatively new ration, is that ration that is fermented in the rumen and the digestive tract, so we get the key nutrients to the key organ, in this case the mammary gland, to produce the amounts of milk components that we're trying to achieve. Therefore, the key in feeding systems is to try to get all four of these rations as similar as possible to meet the cow's requirements. Let's look at a basic definition of feeding system. In my definition, these are the four factors that come into play. One, to deliver the feed to each cow individually. Yes, I recognize at times there may be groups of 100 to 200 cows, but remember, we have to meet each cow's individual requirement even if she's in a mob of cows. Second, we must meet those individual cow requirements based on such things as age of the cow, level of production, and environmental factors and growth factors. Therefore, that is a moving target as well. Thirdly, we'd like to offer this feed free choice or try to get this cow to be fed ad libitum so we can optimize dry matter intake. Historically, we said maximize dry matter intake, but on some farms we have to optimize it because some cows will eat too much and not economically to convert it into milk and production. Fourthly, to provide these nutrients as economically as possible, keeping our feed costs and our income over feed costs as optimal as possible. When we look at feeding systems, there are a number of considerations that will vary from farm to farm. First, the number of cows. There are certain things we can't do with 100 cows that we can do with 1,000 cows. Second, how many potential groups do we have on the farm? This will determine, again, how we may put feeds together. Thirdly, the type of forage storage. For example, if a farmer is only feeding baled hay, this certainly limits some of our feeding system considerations. Fourthly, how we're going to handle grain on the farm, if we're raising it, how we store it, and how we grind it or process it. Next, the milking system can have an impact because it may determine how many groups of animals we have and how often and how easy we are able to move feeds to the various cows. Housing system can be another factor. For example, if we're in an outside system or in a freestall barn, we may determine how we can deliver feed to that. And even the manure system can have impact because it may determine cow movement and how we can get feed to the cows in various bunks and various locations. So all these different factors can determine what is the right system on a dairy farm. Now let's look at some basic feeding system considerations. Generally speaking, there are two types of systems you'll find here in the U.S. The first one is the older system, referred to as component-fed herds. This means we are feeding the individual cow in her environment. The two most common systems would include a stanchion barn, where the cow is confined, and we will top dress or give that feed to the cow. So we bring the feed to the cow and give her certain amounts, either in forks, buckets, pails, or scoops, of feed to that animal, and we may top dress more expensive nutrients to that animal. A second individual system is the electronic grain feeder, where in fact the cow contains some type of an ID system and the feeder automatically dispensed a predetermined amount of grain to that animal. Another component fed herd would be feeding grain in the parlor. This is common in some pasture-based systems because therefore when the cow comes in the parlor, this is the only opportunity for that cow to receive grain. This is less popular in the United States as we go to more sophisticated feeding systems. The second system is a total mix ration, also referred to as TMR. In this system, we blend everything together, also referred to as a complete ration. Therefore, forages, grains, concentrates, minerals, and vitamins are all mixed together, and the cow then consumes to her appetite. Another type of total mix ration is called a partial mix ration, or PMR, which means part of the feed is mixed together, and then the remainder is fed at another source. This is more popular on a pasture-based feeding system. And finally, something called bunk mix, 
which means we are metering in different amounts of feeds on the fly. So we may have corn silage, haylage, high moisture corn, and concentrates coming together in kind of a random mixture, and we are hoping that they mix uniformly, but we are not mixing and weighing these individually as we would with a total mix ration system. Now let's look at our forage system. Generally, I will group them into three different categories. The first one, pasture. These feeds are extremely wet, 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 percent dry matter, depending on stage of maturity and moisture conditions on the farm. On the forage system, on pastures, we can look at three different types of system where the pasture, where the cow goes out and consumes or harvests the feed. The most common and most popular one is called intensive, in which we give the cow a 12 to 24 hour allocation of feed for that mob or group of cows. A second system is rotational, where we simply have four to six to eight different areas where we rotate the cow every three to five days and allow the pasture to recover. Another one that's more common with growing heifers would be continuous, which means the animals has exposure to that feed for several days, several weeks to several months, and there's very little chance for pastures to recover or we can manage intensively. Another pasture system that I call it would be called green chop, which means we go out to the paddock and we harvest that crop directly as it's growing and bring it to the cows. And this is kind of a modified pasture system in that we harvest it every day, perhaps even two or three times a day, and bring the feed to the cow rather than allowing the cow to walk to the feed or trample the feed itself. The second system is a hay-based system. Here we dry the forage down to 75 to 90 percent dry matter, depending on its type of storage and drying conditions. The three more common ways of storing, or four common ways, would be small squares, the big square bales, which are, are basically much, much larger, containing larger amounts of feed and require sophisticated equipment to move around, but very popular to transport hay from different parts of the United States. We can also have the round bale, or we can have hay stacks. You will find these on most dairy farms here in the Midwest, variations of all four of these hay systems, depending on the size of the herd and the amount of equipment that we have on the farm. The third forage system, which we'll talk about, are silages, which means the feed is partially wilted down, in most cases, to 35 to 65 percent dry matter. It is then harvested and stored in one of three different types of structures, what we will call a vertical or upright type storage. This includes our steel silos, such as harvesters, concrete, and slab type structures. These are much less popular now because of the high initial cost and the amount of equipment it takes to get the feed out of the unit. A more popular system is the horizontal type storage, which includes the bunker silo, bags, which are plastic bags laid horizontally and stuffed, if you wish, like a sausage with silages, or piles, which is a bunker which would not have walls, but is covered usually with some type of plastic and tires. A third type of silage that is increasing in popularity on smaller farms would be baleage which simply are round bales or big square bales that are then wrapped in plastic and allowed to ferment in small packages and units and then fed to smaller groups of cows. On our concentrate systems, generally speaking, I will split them out two ways, dry and wet. The dry concentrate normally is feeds are going to be 85 to 90 to 95 percent dry matter. You'll see these being stored or handled on the feeding system on farms as bags or in tanks or on floors. The bag can be the very small 50-pound to 100-pound bag, which most farmers and people can handle, or the very large totes. These can be much larger and usually contain such things as minerals and vitamins, but are in a large bag that are usually handled by some type of lifting of equipment. Tanks are becoming more popular, which basically are vertical storage controlled by electric motors and augers, so we can very accurately dispense feed and cut down on wastage or losses due to spillage or incorrect amounts running in. The third type of concentrate would be on the floor or some type of commodity shed. This could be a granary. It could be some type of large building with several feeding bays in it in which the feed is on the floor and then picked up usually by some type of a skid steer or loading device. We can also have concentrates that are wet. The most common would be high moisture corn, high moisture barley in which we can store these feeds, again, much like silages, as silos, either upright silos, bags, or bunkers. Another wet feed that we'll find will be such things as wet brewer's grain, wet uh, distiller's grain, which are usually stored on the floor, and in many cases covered with some type of tarp or plastic, trying to minimize 
mold and losses due to fermentation and spoilage. Another new system will be the liquid tank. These are coming on much larger farms, which primarily carry molasses, and then blended with the molasses could contain such things as urea, minerals, and other nutrients that are then dispensed and pumped onto the total mix ration by using motors and can be done very effectively and efficiently. The final step then is to put the feeding system together. And this is a bit of an art, but here are some guidelines that I would use. As students, you may want to change these numbers based on your location and what you know about feeding dairy cows. On a component-fed dairy farm, this is attracted to smaller herd sizes. I use the guideline of less than 100 cows. Other farms, this could be as low as 50 to as high as 150. But it's usually more intensive hand-type feeding systems trying to maximize feed and performance on the cows. The hay-based system also applies to smaller herds, usually smaller herd sizes of less than 100 cows, or in feeding systems that do not allow for total mixed ration, because many of the total mixed ration systems can handle large volumes of hay, like 10, 12, or 15 pounds of hay per cow per day, because the system just cannot break it down and uniformly blend it. Silages uh, appear on most farms, and again, how we store it, I would anticipate bag storage on smaller herd sizes. I use the number of 150 cows. However, larger herd sizes will usually go to bunkers and piles because it is faster to get the feed in and they must have to store much larger quantities at the time of harvesting and ensiling. Pastures is another system where we will look at, especially for smaller herd sizes that are trying to keep low costs and lower investments on the farm. Usually we'll find the partial TMR and component grain feeding at parlors the most common way to complement a pasture-based system. And then finally, we must ask the farmer, how many groups can they have on the farm? Generally speaking, when we look at total mixed rations, we must have two dry cow groups, a high production group, a heifer or first lactation group, and then a low production group, and then multiples thereof. We may also look at a reproduction group, a mastitis group, and other factors so you can see how this grouping can also have an impact on the feeding system. So in summary, the bottom line is no one system is right for everybody in Illinois or in Wisconsin or the United States. It really has to fit what is existing on the farm, herd sizes, feed availability, investments, and factors like that. Second, feed costs must be considered. Obviously, feed costs make up 30 to 40% of the cost of producing milk. So if my system can keep feed costs lower, that allows me for a greater potential for profit and margin. Thirdly, you must allow for future expansion. You may only be milking 100 cows today, but perhaps in the next 10 years, you, your son, daughter, or someone who buys the farm will want to milk more cows. Make sure the system allows for expansion and movement of more feed and cows on the farm. Fourthly, we must optimize dry matter intake. High producing cows must be able to consume 50, 55 pounds of dry matter a day. And finally, we must control the four rations we talked about trying to make them as similar on paper, in the feed bunk, what the cow consumes, and what the cow actually digests in her ration. Well, this completes our module on feeding system. Thanks, and have a good day.